I'm Michael Carey, the pastor of Church in the Wild. And today, I thought we'd begin with an introduction. This is Busta. Busta is our dog, and we adopted him about a year ago. And Busta often hangs out with me when I do my recordings in the backyard. And Busta, the reason I want to introduce you <laughs> is because uh, it's because Jesus had something to say about dogs. So <laughs> we're going to let you listen from wherever you want here in the yard. <laughs> so last week we, uh, uh, excuse me, <laughs> last week we read that Jesus de-emphasized the Jewish traditions that related to ceremonial cleanliness. And he said, what makes a person holy is not what goes inside a person. It's what comes out of the heart. Today we read more of how he, he did not let himself be limited by the traditions, the religious traditions given to him by, from his Jewish heritage, but he fulfilled God's promises to the Jews by taking the covenant that was given to the Jews and bringing it to all people. And this happens in a very surprising way today. We're going to read that God's mission took him outside of Israel to what's now the coast of Lebanon. And so we begin reading with Mark chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence a secret. So Tyre was a large Phoenician port city of Syria. He probably was staying in a Jewish house Jews were a minority, probably had a Jewish ghetto there in this large pagan Gentile city of Tyre. And it's not shocking that the word got out about what Jesus could do for people. And so we read in verse 26, or excuse me, now this is verse 25. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syria, Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. Now the shocking thing is that when this woman came to Jesus for help, he insulted her and, and would not help. Verse 27, first let the children eat all they want, Jesus told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yeah. The ch by the children, he's referring to the Jewish people, uh, God's covenant people um, who were promised the Messiah. Um, now, it doesn't help much to hear that he was referring to her as a dog to know that in the original Greek word, it, it means more like puppies. <laughs> it's not right to take the food promised for the children, the Jews, and throw it to their puppies. Uh, this, was, uh, this was an ins insult word. This was a Jewish slur of the Gentiles for being ceremonially unclean. Brothers and sisters, this was not a world where people pampered their pets. I looked it up. <laughs> In near 2019, Americans spent $96 billion on their pets. Not so much in ancient Israel. So why would Jesus call this Gentile woman a dog to her face. Well, Matthew's gospel adds, I was sent only to the lost sheep of, of Israel. It, it just doesn't fit with the Jesus we know. Um, not only his rudeness, but also the exclusivity that he would say to her, you know, the father sent me only for the lost sheep of Israel. Now we're going to tackle that whole issue in a few minutes, but first let's hear the end of the story, verse 28 to 30. Yes, Lord, the woman replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then Jesus told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. <laughs> So our first reaction is, wow, how clever, how bold she was to say that to Jesus. 
Okay, yes, Jews consider people like me to be d d dogs, but even the dogs get the food that's dropped off the table. That is pretty clever. One stream of interpretation says that Jesus was actually not sure of the limits of God's grace, that he started with a Jewish family and he, with his disciples, ventured out and he encountered people like the centurion in, in uh, Capernaum. He was a, a good guy to the Jews and so he healed his servant. But Jesus is basically kind of exploring and it's the woman's response that helps Jesus understand the Father's will that the promises for the Jews ultimately will be made available for all people. Now that's intriguing, but I don't think that's the most accurate answer because Jesus did know the Father's will. Jesus knew that, that God had called the Jewish people into a covenant relationship in order in the fullness of time to bless every person. And Jesus knew this because he knew the scriptures. The prophet Isaiah, chapter 49, verse 6, speaking for the Lord, said, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Jesus knew his Father's will. The Father, starting by sending his Son to gather the band of Jews, the Twelve, and to develop a following. And as the Messiah ministered around Galilee, fulfilling the promises that the Messiah would seek and save his own people, also laid the groundwork to take the good news of God's kingdom to every nation after his death and resurrection. So that still brings us back to the question, why did the pagan woman get a no from Jesus when she asked for help? Why did he resist her appeal for help? I think when you look at this story and compare it to the other stories of healing, the answer is pretty obvious. Jesus, with his presence on earth, positioned himself to raise the hopes, to raise the expectations of people, to take that, that little ember of hope that God will do something with, with their hurt, their disease, their demonic possession, and to fan it into flame, and to cultivate a boldness and a, and a courage to ask for what Jesus wants to give. That Jesus, this was his pattern, because faith involves humility. Faith involves a deep desire to do whatever it takes to open your hands and to receive what God wants to give. Faith is rooted in a singular desire to overcome whatever holds you back, to do whatever it takes with the power of God. You see, Jesus still does that with his children. Even those of us who have already welcomed Jesus Christ to be our Savior and Lord. Even many of us, we still harbor hurts, brokenness. We still have deep sources of unhappiness in our lives. And he wants to cultivate in us bold, courageous faith so that we will not be satisfied with what holds us back. You know, as I record this, it's just a few weeks after Martin Luther King weekend, and it's, we're about to start Black History Month. And, and this time period between MLK weekend and Black History Month, it, it's a time for recalling the courageous stories of African Americans who had the faith that God would be with them as they, as they did whatever it took according to, according to Christian principles to overcome um, those who were trying to keep them from their best life. Um, even this past week, we've heard about the death of Hamron Hank Aaron, the baseball player, the home run hitter, and Cicely Tyson, the actress who, who broke so many glass ceilings. 
It inspires us, whatever our race, to not let anything get in the way of, of achieving God's will for our lives. And so I ask you, whoever you are, whatever your circumstances, what remains broken in your life? What's holding you back? Pray fervently, boldly, pleading with God, challenging God to bring you wholeness. Ask God to show you what you need to do to get well, to be liberated, to be reconciled. Have the humility to tell God in your prayer life, you will do whatever it takes in following his desire for your wholeness to pursue that wholeness. And perhaps as you pray, you'll sense in your spirit, you'll hear from God ways that you should take the initiative, whether it's to pursue counseling, whether it is to pursue, to, to forgive others, whether it's to pursue reconciliation, whether it is to, with great rigor, undertake lifestyle changes. Of course, there's no guarantee that because you ask, you'll get the healing that you want. In this life, God does not always heal us of that which holds us back. God does not always answer every prayer the way we would like. Not till Jesus comes and finishes the kingdom will that happen. We know that from Scripture. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, testified that three times he prayed for deliverance from a physical ailment he called his thorn in the flesh. And three times he heard the same answer from our Lord. No, no, but my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made great in your weakness. And so whatever it is we face, trusting God with the outcome, let us ask with boldness let us pursue healing courageously because often he will give us what we want and whatever he chooses to do, like Jesus with that woman, he will be pleased that we asked.